Hey everybody, carrying on with the translation of Act 2, Scene 3 of uh, Much Ado About Nothing. And you've hopefully been watching the series in the playlist to know where we're up to. So we have the um, humorous scene where they're trying to wind up Benedict to make him believe that Beatrice is in love with him. And Don Pedro says, She doth well, if she should make tender of her love, tis very possible he'll scorn it, for the man, as you know all, hath a contemptible spirit. In other words, you know what, she's right. If she offered her love to him, it's very probable he'd scorn it. We all know he has a contemptuous nature. Claudio says he's a very proper man. In other words, he's a very good-looking man. And Claudio, uh, Don Pedro says he hath indeed a good outward happiness. Yes, he does look good. Claudio says, before God, and in my mind, very wise. Well, he's very clever as well. And Don Pedro says, he doth indeed show some sparks that are like wit. Yes, he is occasionally, uh, you know, uh, clever. Claudio says, I take him to be valiant, so he's brave as well. And Don Pedro here uh, praises him as Hector, I assure you. And in the managing of quarrels, you may say he is wise, for either he avoids them with great discretion or undertakes them with the most Christian-like fear. So he's saying, well, he's, he's as brave as Hector, uh, the hero of Greek mythology, surely, and very clever at managing his fights. You might say he either discreetly avoids fights or approaches them with the same fearful reverence as a Christian approaches God. And Leonardo says, if he do fear God and must necessarily keep peace, if he break the peace, he ought to enter into a quarrel with fear and trembling. Well, if he does fear God, it's his duty to keep the peace. And if he gets into a fight, then he should indeed go into it with fear and trembling. He shouldn't want to have a fight. And Don Pedro says, and so will he do, for the man doth fear God, howsoever it seems not in him, by some large jests he will make. Well, I'm sorry for your niece. Shall we go seek Benedict and tell him of our love? So, you know, Don Pedro is saying what well, he does, for he is a God-fearing man, however much his coarse jokes make him seem otherwise. I'm very sorry for your niece. Shall we go find Benedict and tell him that she loves him? And Claudio says, never tell him, my lord. Let him wear it out with good counsel. No, let's not tell him. Let her passion burn itself out. Leonardo says, no, that's impossible. She may wear her heart out first. No, you know, she could die before uh, she gets over this. Don Pedro, always wise, says, well, uh, we will hear further of it by your daughter. Let it cool the while. I love Benedict well, and I could wish he would modestly examine himself to see how much he is unworthy, so good a lady. In other words, we'll put the plan on hold for a bit. Um, I'm very fond of Benedict. I wish he would have a good hard look at himself and see that he'd actually be very lucky to have such a good woman for a wife. Leonardo says, my lord, will you walk? Dinner is ready. So shall we go off to eat uh, and, and have dinner? And Claudio says, if he do not dote up on her upon this, I will never trust my expectation. So again, an aside quietly to Don Pedro and to Leonardo. If this doesn't make him fall for her, you know, I'll never trust my own judgment again. Don Pedro says, let there be the same net spread for her. And that must your daughter and her gentlewoman carry the sport will be when they hold one an opinion of another's dotage and no such matter. Uh, that's the scene that I would see, which will be merely a dumb show. Let us send her to call him in to dinner. So in other words, we'll play the same trick on Beatrice. Your daughter and her companion must do it. And the fun will really start when they both believe the other loves them. Though, of course, that's not true. That's what I'm looking forward to seeing. And I mean seeing as they'll both be struck dumb. They won't be able to speak. It won't be that we hear it. Now, let's send Beatrice to come and get Benedict into dinner. Now, Benedict then, coming forward from his hiding place, having heard all of this. This can be no trick. The conference was sadly born. They have the truth of this from Hero. They seem to pity the lady. It seems her affections have their full bent. Love me? Why, it must be requited. I hear how I am censured. They say I will bear myself proudly if I perceive the love come from her. They say, too, that she would rather die than give any sign of affection. I did never think to marry. I must not seem proud. Happy are they that hear their detractions and can put them to mending. They say the lady is fair. Tis a truth I can bear them witness. And virtuous tis so I cannot reprove it. And wise, but for loving me. 
By my troth, it is no addition to her wit, nor no great argument of her folly, for I will be horribly in love with her. I may, chance, have some odd quirks and remnants of wit broken on me, because I have railed so long against marriage. But doth not the appetite alter? A man loves the meat in his youth that he cannot endure in his age. Shall quips and sentences and these paper bullets of the brain awe a man from the career of his humour? No, the world must be peopled. When I said I would die a bachelor, I did not think I should live till I were married. Here comes Beatrice. By this day she's a fair lady. I do spy some marks of love in her. So, here's what Benedict's saying. There's no way this is a trick, because they weren't giggling. They were really serious about it. And, of course, they've got hero's testimony too. In fact, they seem to feel sorry for Beatrice. It seems she's totally infatuated. She loves me. Well, that love must be returned. I hear how they criticise me. They say I'll be really smug if I think she loves me. They also said she'd rather die than show me any sign of affection. I never expected to get married. I mustn't blow my chance by seeming smug. It's a fortunate person who can take criticism and mend his ways as a result. They say she is beautiful, and I can witness to that, and virtuous, that's true. I have no evidence to the contrary, and clever, except in loving me, which is no great advertisement for her cleverness, but it won't be proof of her foolishness, as I will be horribly in love with her. I might get a bit of stick here and there, because I've been so anti-marriage so long, but can't tastes change? Uh, a man loves to eat steak in his youth, but might detest it in old age. Should wisecracks and old sayings and stinging words scare a man out of what, doing what he wants? No, the world needs to be populated. When I said I would die a bachelor, I just meant I didn't think I'd live to be married. Here comes Beatrice, looking stunning. I think I see signs of love in her. Now, this next bit is the, the absolute funniest bit in the entire play for me. Um, and it's the final moments of, of Act 2. Beatrice says, against my will, I am sent to bid you come in to dinner. In other words, look, I, I didn't want to do this, but I've been told it's time for dinner. And Benedict, thinking Beatrice loves him, says, fair Beatrice, I thank you for your pains. My lovely Beatrice, thank you for the, the efforts you've gone to. Beatrice says, I took no more pains for those thanks than you take pains to thank me. If it had been painful, I would not have come. In other words, you know, it wasn't painful. Uh, I took no pains to get your thanks, then you took pains to thank me, and if it had been painful, I wouldn't have done it. Benedict says, you take pleasure then in the message, so, you know, you, you're happy to bring me the message? And Beatrice says, yea, just so much as you may take pleasure upon a nice point and choke a door withal. You have no stomachs in your, fare you, fare you well. So in other words, I took about as much pleasure as you could fit on the point of a knife and choke a foolish bird with. If you're not hungry, sir... I'll say goodbye. And here, it's my favourite bit of the entire play. Benedict says, Ha! Against my will, I am sent to bid you come in to dinner. There's a double meaning in that. I took no more pains for those thanks than you took pains to thank me. That's as much as to say any pains that I take for you is as easy as thanks. If I do not take pity of her, I am a villain. If I do not love her, I am a Jew. I will go get her picture. So, What's he saying? He's saying, against my will, I've been sent to call you for dinner. The words she said there have a double meaning, a hidden meaning. I took no more pains to get your thanks than you took pains to thank me. Well, what she's really saying is doing anything for you is as easy as saying thank you. I'd have to be a really odd person not to take pity on her and have a heart of stone not to love her. I will go and get a miniature of her maid as a sign of love. And that's the end of Act 2. Please do subscribe to the channel. Thanks for watching.